So um, we're going to jump into tonight and uh, we'll get rolling on what we have for you tonight. So tonight we are continuing in this series. We're going now into section six. Um, we've covered one through five, understanding who God is, the basis and foundational piece that we started. You got to know who he is. And then, of course, establishing a relationship with him. You got to know who he is to know who you're establishing a relationship with. Uh, we talked about salvation which, uh, of course, is a core principle of the church. And, and what this is about, having a relationship with God, is being what's sa being saved all about. Not taking anything for assumption. But what does it mean to be saved? What is baptism all about? How does that tie into the concept of salvation? And we try and share these things with you because there's so many different things taught out there and focus and direction that I wanted to ha want to help you to understand how these things fit together and what the Bible really tells us about them. By the way, if you've been at the church, um, you probably have one of these books because people who are going through the class have this in book form. And I'm teaching from the book form of this. This is available to you at the church and continuing on from there into understanding now practical things, God's will for your life last week and God's place in our daily lives today. What's his will? What does God see for me? What did he create me for? That was last week. This week, um, you know, how does God fit into my my normal life, my real life issues, my day-to-day -day experiences? Where is God in the middle of all of that? That's what we want to talk about tonight and try and give you a little bit of a deeper understanding of God's desire in terms of your life. Now, remember, we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about the fact that God is a God of relationship. This is very important for us to understand. God is really about establishing relationships with us. You know, hence the name of the core, establishing a relationship with God. God wants a relationship with you. And so it ties into every other aspect in terms of how we connect to God, how we relate to him, how God... Uh, feels and interacts with our life all ties back to the same thing. And so it, that's why it's so important to understand it. And I, I feel it's important to uh, describe it, express it, teach it in this manner, in this way, this direction, because it makes everything else make sense. What we don't want the Bible to be and our relationship with God, with God to be is just a, a series of rules and regulations. Do this, don't that, don't do that. And many times you get that impression that being a child of God is just about following the rules. Give me the rules, okay? Thou shalt not. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. A whole lot of don'ts, by the way. Well, what do we do, <laughs> right? You know, why does God make us the way that he makes us? Why does God allow us to continue to live if it's just about being saved? So many questions. And that's what we're trying to help put together for you in understanding. And I think it all really comes together the best when you understand it in terms of the relationship God desires to set up between you and him. So we're going to jump into section six now this week, um, God's place in our daily lives. And there's again, in the, in the uh, style of this, uh, this booklet, there are questions and answers. There's questions and then answers to be determined surrounding those questions. And so the first question here is, uh, the discussion here is God's role in our lives, right? What is God's role in our lives? And what I'm saying here in this next passage is I think it's best and easiest for us to consider our relationship with God in terms of a marriage. Keep in mind that God created the concept of marriage on earth. And many of the concepts that he gives us really establishes to us the concepts that he has in general. God is uh, reflecting himself, his character, his desire, his feeling about things through many of the things that he creates in the earth, both in terms of physical creation itself, in terms of when we look at the history of the Old Testament, there are so many things there, like clues in a, hidden in a map that reveal to us things about the thought process, the consciousness of God, that it's amazing when you study and find those little nuggets that say, man, this ties exactly to what God intends for us. And so in all these different aspects of nature and humanity, 
Because remember, we're made in his image, his image, not the other way around. So we're not, he's not made uh, to be like us. We're made to be like him. And so what he makes helps define him. Any artist that creates something, be it a painter, be a sculptor, when they create, there are things surrounding their personality, their specific, unique character that come out in their art, be it music, whatever the case may be. That's why you can look at certain paintings, listen to certain music, and recognize by style who the author is. Because there's a correlation between uh, what comes out of a person and who the person is. What you say describes you. The things that you do, the way that you behave, are all things that help to describe you in terms of your character, your personality, your identity. Okay, that's not going to work. Camera's not working. So, um, always have a backup. <laughs> so, understand that God. we understand God more and more by looking at what he either creates or tells us. And so in this particular case, I want you to understand the concept of marriage is a concept that came from God. He defined it, described it, applied it to us. And then we see in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about the bride of Christ and the relationship between the husband and the wife and the bride and his, excuse me, Christ and his church. These things tell us this is the nature of God. So think about being married to God. Think about that level of bond and, and connection. Now, it's not exactly the same because, of course, we're not with God, male and female. But it is the concept uh, that we're reflecting and that God is reflecting in terms of how we relate, the relationship that happens between us, how we care for each other, the bond, the covenant that we talked about early are all things that are defined in what we call today marriage, right? The commitment aspect of it. This is one of the reasons in the church we have a discrepancy between people who are married and people who just live together. The difference is the commitment, the vow to one another, the bond, the, 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 the covenant relationship, the codependence is all part of the concept of being married. And there are people that kind of avoid and misdirect. And, and there's oftentimes a problem, an issue in terms of that relationship because it's not fully bonded, it's not fully committed, it's not fully connected the way it should be. God would offer you the same thing. And by the way, the same mentality that oftentimes come through in a cohabitation without marriage can often be the same mindset that we carry into our relationship with God. And it's problematic because it's kind of like, you know, God, uh, yeah, I like you and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be around from time to time and I want to get stuff from you, but I don't really want to commit to you. You know, I, I just want to have a connection to you. I want you to be there when I come around. You know, but I don't necessarily, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to go anywhere else. And, you know, I need I need my flexibility. I need my freedom. I, I want to be able to do me. Uh, and then I'll come back and do you. I'll do you on Sunday, occasionally, you know, when I'm available. Uh, but I also do my own thing. But I'd like to be able to reach out to you when I need something. <laughs> doesn't that sound familiar? That's the way many relationships are. And that's the way we try and mentally treat God. But God is really about having a covenant marriage type of relationship with us. There is a commitment between both sides. God is committed to us. We are committed to him through the good and the bad, the thick and the thin, you know, richer and poor, sickness and health. That's the relationship God wants. When you understand that in terms of your relationship with God, it sets up an understanding of what you now can expect. What do you expect of a husband or a wife in terms of your relation, I'm talking about one that's truly committed and connected to you and in covenant with you, what's your expectation in terms of your relationship with that man or that woman? That will help you to better understand the expectation we have of God and that God has of us. So God is looking for a marriage type of relationship between himself and us. And so God desires engagement, right? He wants there to be engagement, connection. God is not just like, okay, we get married and then he goes off and lives in heaven for the next 60 years of your life 
and you just do your thing here on earth and, and survive, you know, and hear from him occasionally and write you a letter, right? That's not the type of relationship God's looking for. He looks to be engaged. Think about from the beginning with Adam and Eve, where he desired he would come down and spend time with them. Not necessarily every moment. Husband and wife won't spend every moment together, but we spend quality time. We spend time together and we enjoy that time. We value that time. So, and, and we work on things together. We discuss things. We work through problems together. All those things are about engagement. God, you know, some people would not believe this, but God wants that kind of relationship with you. Well, you say, well, why isn't he around then? Why can't I see him? Why don't I hear from him? Hang on a second. We'll get to that in a minute. But understand that that is the desire and intent of God. If that's his intent, then let's talk about how we get there, right? So he desires involvement with you. He's not just a God to sit up high and, and never be involved. God is far more involved than we can realize. And we need to understand how God is involved in our lives. He's involved in ways you can't even see or understand. Uh, it doesn't mean just because you don't see him that he's not involved. Because, number three, God cares. He cares about what's happening to you. And so as a child of God, God is careful to see, understand everything that is happening in your life. Both the good and the bad. One thing we have to understand is oftentimes the bad is either as a result of doors we opened or it's something that is necessary, sometimes for reasons we don't fully understand. We can't see. We can't fully grasp it. But I always want to believe that if I'm going through something, you know, the first thing you want to do is check that I do something. Is it me? Lord, did I mess up somehow in our relationship? Did I fall away from you? Did I forget about you? Did I turn? Right? Because obviously that'll cause you a problem. The second thing is, I believe then it must be necessary. We have good and bad, ups and downs. Sometimes those downs have a necessary purpose in our life. The good thing about realizing that is if you realize that the necessary, amen, the bad is necessary, then you can believe that there's purpose for it. And that purpose may not be something we can fully grasp, understand, or even we may not be the ones to truly gain from it. But when you can believe that God is working for your good, when you can believe that God has a bigger, higher plan involved, then that means there are times I may go through some things and that's okay because God's plan is going to work out. And even if it doesn't work out for me directly, it's something that I will have made a sacrifice to see God execute and do. Many times what we're doing is not for us, it's for the next generation, it's for people around us, it's for somebody that's watching you go through. Think about that. Somebody may be being blessed, inspired, and drawn because they're watching how you go through a situation. And there are people that need to see you go through a situation in order for them to build up the strength and faith to go through situations. And so you have to understand that God does care. He doesn't find any delight in putting you through things that make you sad, things that take away from you, things that hurt, things that are losses in your life. He doesn't uh, want to, to disappoint you. He doesn't want you to be, lose in your expectations. That's not what God is about. So when you understand this basis of premise, then you can build on top of that. Let's talk about communicating with God. How do we communicate with God? Now, communication is a vital thing, right? In any relationship, any marriage. You know, many relationships get destroyed because of poor communication. Oftentimes, the key is remedying the communication issues in a relationship, in a friendship, in relationships in the church. If we're not communicating well and effectively, then it, caught, it opens the opportunity for more, a deeper and deeper gap and divide between people. It strains the relationship. So you got to communicate well to have a good relationship. How do we communicate with God? Well, the first and most principled way is through prayer. It's not necessarily through seeing him all the time, but it is through communicating with them. Prayer is really the key that we have in terms of communication. And I emphasize here two-way communication. Because prayer is not just about talking to God, it's about talking with God. 
Prayer is intended to be a two-way thing. We need to understand that because many times we think prayer is when we come and wherever we go and we just start saying stuff. We keep talking, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray. Lord, we need this. Oh, God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. And we talk and we talk and we talk and we talk and we talk. How good of a conversation do you have with anyone who is talking to you the entire time? Generally, not a good one. They may walk away feeling, hey, we had a great conversation, right? But you're sitting there like, hmm, yeah, I, yeah, um, <laughs> you didn't hear a thing I said, right? Because you didn't give me the opportunity to say it. Because communication is not as much about what you say, it's about what the other person receives. Two-way communication ensures that both people are receiving understanding from what is being said. They'll teach you, and they teach you things in, in leadership classes, in different courses, that you have to learn how to communicate in a way that the other person can receive it. It doesn't matter what you said or how you said or how clear you thought you were in it. What really matters is how the person perceived it. It's an interesting test that they would teach you to do sometimes, and it can be really enlightening, where after you tell someone what you, whatever it is you're thinking, you ask them or invite them to repeat back what they heard. And many times, husbands, wives, you ought to try this sometimes, many times you'll find what comes back at you is like, whoa, I, well, that is not what I said, or that is not what I meant. Right, because I said one thing, they took it another way, and it comes back at you. It's like, wait a minute, that's that's not no, no, no. That means you had poor communication. So communication is about transferring understanding of what you're thinking or feeling between one person and the next. And oftentimes, you have to learn how to communicate not the way you like to hear it, but the way they need to hear it, because they're different communication styles. I have time for all that tonight. But um, you have to learn how to adapt how you communicate so that that person best receives what you have. And by the way, there are multiple types of communication, uh, communicators and communication styles out there, which means you may have to communicate to different people different ways because this person's communication style is different from this one's and it's different from this one. So I have to communicate one way. It's like, think about it. You have three people around you and they all speak three different languages. Just because you speak one language doesn't mean you can communicate with all three of them. You have to be able to speak in their language. And so when it comes to God, we're looking to have communication with them, which means, of course, God can understand our language. He can understand our thoughts, but we need opportunity for it to be two-way. We have to be able to speak to God, and we have to be able to hear from God, which means when I pray, I shouldn't necessarily be focused on talking the whole time. Same thing, by the way, goes along with worship. Worship is a form of interaction as well, and those interactions uh, are intended to be two-way. Intimacy is intended to be two-way. It's not just one person showing, expressing towards the other, but both ways. And so your communication needs to involve both speaking to God and listening from God. If you're not ever taking a pause or time to hear, then don't be surprised that you're not getting feeling good about your communication with God. Maybe you got everything off your chest, you got your checklist off, but what have you heard from God? When am I going to hear from God? Well, you got to, in the midst of communicating, stop and listen for God. What is God saying to me? Now, some people ask the question, why do I have to speak when God already knows my thoughts? Can I just pray in my mind? You can. God understands your mind and your thoughts even before you speak them. However, however, two issues. When you're not speaking and trying to pray, probably the same issue, just kind of two observations about it. When you're trying to just pray silently, you'll find that it'll be very easy to be distracted because there are many other things that will come at you, that will circle through your mind and distract you from what you're trying to do. It's a natural thing and it's a spiritual thing. The other side of that is when you pray and speak things out. First of all, the Bible tells us spiritually there's power in what you speak. 
Your authority actually comes from what you speak. And so releasing things out of your mouth has a spiritual power associated with it. Remember, God created things by speaking the word. He could have thought the world into existence, but he didn't just think it, he spoke it. When he spoke it, he was releasing authority that was already in him. The concept, the potential, the ability to create the world was already in him. But it didn't happen until he released that authority by speaking, let there be light. And so understand that when you speak something out, there's another level of authority that it goes with what you speak. The other thing is, by speaking it, there's an alignment of your mouth, your thought, and your spirit. As you speak something out, it automatically aligns you to what you're speaking. And that alignment is not just on the outside, it's on the inside. That's why people will tell you about making things like declarations. I am a good person. I am a good person. I'm a confident person. I believe I can do this. I believe that I can do this. If you say, I hope I can do it, 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 it's a different positioning, not only on the outside, but on the inside, from if you, from versus if you say, I know I can do this. Because what you say aligns your whole mindset, your whole person. And so by praying out loud, by speaking things out loud, by singing out loud, even in worship, you know, there's something about releasing those things through your mouth outwardly that aligns with your spirit. So when you pray and speak it out, it will align. I learned this practically many, many years ago when I was younger because you try and go down on your knees and pray and you pray silently and before you know it, you're either nodding off or you're thinking about the football game that's coming up or you're distracted because did I leave something on, on, the, on the burners at home? You know, all these distractions come. But when you begin to speak it out and speak it out, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. I give you the glory. Lord, have your way. Lord, I need your, your help. I'm seeking your face right now. You will find that as you speak that out, you'll feel this alignment, sense of alignment that comes up. And it will begin to continue to pour out of you because it, you, you form a direction and a flow in what you're praying. So praying outwardly, speaking it is powerful. Don't forget to pause. Don't forget to give God a chance in the conversation. A lot of people, when you have especially corporate prayers and when you pause, everybody gets antsy. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody gets like, okay, what's next? What do we do? Why, why aren't we saying anything? What's going to happen? Can we do something? No. That is your time to listen. The same thing in worship. And when you have, uh, have been worshiping God and there's a release and, and, um, and the power, you feel and sense the power of God's presence, then I'm shifting to listen. This is all the worship leaders out there. You have to learn to pause and not be afraid to listen to, what, to the direction of God in where you're going or where you should go next. What you should say. What direction we should be going. What does God want to do? Maybe God wants to pause and have an altar call and draw people into the presence that's going on right now. We have to learn how to have two-way communication. Now, time is moving. i got to keep going. But this is an important point. I hope this is helping somebody. Let's keep going. How to pray. Um, the first thing that you want to think about when you uh, pray is how we approach God. You want to be, this talks about being thankful and down the earth, but this particular scripture really is about the difference between how you approach God. I approach him boldly, arrogantly. God, I, listen, I'm your child and I, I, I'm glad I'm not like these other folks, God, because I'm saved and I'm grateful to be able to come to you versus uh, the, the poor person who comes and says, Lord, have God, God have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I know. I know. I know. You don't have to even tell me. I know. The thoughts that are in my heart, the things that I've said, the things that I've done, have mercy on me, God. It's about attitude and that humble attitude when we approach God. The Lord's Prayer has some powerful, powerful things in it when Jesus teaches them to pray. I want to talk to this very quickly. It says in Matthew 6, 7, but when you hear, when you pray, use not vain repetitions. This first thing, prayer is more than just repeating something somebody else said. Prayer is more than repeating uh, even what Jesus says here because it's not just about saying words it's about expression from the heart. Jesus gives us this prayer to show us an approach to prayer. 
not to say literally this is what you should pray every day. And I know, and I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, and I'm not saying it's bad. There are people that truly believe in that aspect of it. I repeat the Lord's Prayer every service, every time I say that. But that's not the real intent of Christ here, is to teach us a repetitive prayer. He starts it by saying, not, don't use vain repetition, repeat the same thing. So that clearly he didn't give us this for us to make it a vain repetition. He gives it to us to show us the concept, the content, the approach of prayer. And so he goes on here to say, uh, then he gives us you know, the, the aspect of it. Be not, you, uh, be not you therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. So God already knows, but yet he talks about asking for daily bread. So he's not saying that's a bad thing, but he's saying for those that come across in this, this heathen aspect way, thinking they're going to be heard for much speaking. God is not concerned about how much you say. He's not the volume of what you say. He's not concerned about you hitting the pitch. He's not concerned about you rhyming. That's entertainment. God is concerned about what's in your heart. And he does desire us when we pray to express from our heart to him. And that's not always the same prayer, right? But how we approach it, verse 9, is after this manner, after this manner, not repeat after me, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first aspect and attribute of prayer is worship, is reverence, is knowing and unrecognizing who God is and reverencing him as the Lord of our life. Thy kingdom come, is, is that will be done. This is a declaration of the release of God's power and presence into this world. God, let your will, your power, let all that you are. Because remember, as children of God, we are his designates. We are his delegates here on the earth. And our intent and desire is to represent him. So Lord, let the things of you, the things of the heaven, be released in this earth. We are the channel that opens the gate for the presence of God in this earth. Here he talks about regular needs, daily bread. Give us this day our, our, our daily bread. Lord, we're asking for you to supply our needs. We believe that you'll supply our needs. And by the way, you don't have to say each of these segments every prayer either. We forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. He talks about the power of forgiveness we forgive, help us to forgive and forgive us. Lead us not into temptation. Man, we need that. Lord, keep us, deliver us from evil. Keep us from those things that are trying to destroy us, those that are attacking us, those spirits that we don't even know of. For thine is the kingdom. He closes again with reverence and de declaring the power and presence of God. It's these aspects of prayer that are relevant more so than the literal prayer itself. And it's important that as we continue with prayer, we also are about this concept of reflecting and releasing things uh, that are going on in our lives. Jesus prayed and he went to his father and he prayed. And the Bible says at times we see him praying until s s blood flows, sweat becomes mixed with blood flowing from his, in the strain of the moment. He's praying for the real situation. And notice he did not go into uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and start with our Father, that which art in heaven. Now, he might have prayed to his Father. He might have prayed, but, but man, he was into the real of the moment. I believe when Jesus went to pray, he went to talk to God. And that's why he had such a frequent and consistent prayer life because he went to talk to his father. Remember, he says, everything that I do, I first heard of him. So he spends a lot of time communicating with his father. And he is the example to us of what God wants from us as sons and daughters of God. Communication with God is intended to be a regular and natural thing. Let's continue on. It says here, uh, what do you pray for? First of all, for God's will. We get this from the prayer. We pray for the will of God. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done. We're praying for your will, Lord, in this earth. We are your delegates. We represent you. So Lord, let your will be done here. You can pray for, to God for what you feel. This is what I'm going through. This is what I'm feeling right now. You can pray to him 
in the good and the bad. You know, you saw uh, David who wrote the Psalms, and the Psalms are often based on his communication, his prayer with God, his expressions of God. And sometimes they were good days, and sometimes they were bad days. Sometimes he was going through it, and Lord, I need your protection. I need you, I need you to be with me. Lord, see all these that are coming against me, all my enemies. There are other times he was joyful, making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. There are times when he just, he is filled with all the goodness of what God is releasing in his life. You can tell God what you feel. And, and you're, you may feel mad. You may feel upset. You may feel hurt. God already knows it, right? But there's something powerful about expressing it to God. God, I'm, I'm having a rough time right now. I don't know how to deal with what's going on. And you'll find oftentimes David started at that. Man, I'm messed up. I don't know what I'm going to do. But by the time he gets done, he's at a point of, well, I will trust you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. No, I, I know you're going to come through. He encourages his own soul through what he is doing and saying in prayer. So especially to those of us who are, are not good at expressing our emotions, uh, we tend to keep them bald and, and contained. There's something about praying to God and opening and releasing those things that's powerful, that's helpful, that's beneficial. And God loves and respects when you pray to him openly and honestly. Pray for the needs of others. There are others around you. And you can, it's okay. There's no problem with praying. Lord God, remember my neighbor. Remember my friend. Remember the one over in China. Remember the one in Africa. Remember Ukraine. For God, I'm praying for my neighborhood. We lift up these things in prayer to God. Just remember again to take some time every now and then in a healthy prayer life to listen. God, I have a problem. I don't know what to do. Let God speak to you. Especially when you sense the presence of of God. When you sense the presence of God, it's the best time to pause and say, God, what do you have to say to me? What do you want to do to me? Lord, I surrender to you. When I say pause, I'm going to stop the prayer, but stay in the presence. Let God speak to you. Take your time. Let him, let him do whatever he wants to do in you and through you. Sometimes God is moving on you and healing you without words. Sometimes as the presence of God is overshadowing you, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit making intercession through groanings. There are times when God is healing you and it's not even word-based. It's spirit-based. God is a spirit. We have a spirit. God can interact with us spiritually. There are times when you go down in prayer burden and you'll get up from prayer and you just feel like something's lifted. And there wasn't a word spoken, but there's something that changed in the midst of what was happening and what was released in that prayer. This is the power of relationship with God. God is not one that just wants to sit on, on top of the throne and not be connected to you. He wants to be involved, and you have the privilege and opportunity to open that through prayer. Let's talk about a couple more things before time runs out. Let's talk about hearing from God. How, what does it mean to hear from God? How do I hear from God? Am I listening for God to come and just begin to speak to me as he did with Moses through the burning bush? Am I listening for thunderous clouds and a voice to come out of them? Well, God actually speaks in many, many different ways. I always like this little table here. It talks about the various ways that God speaks because he doesn't speak to us all the same way. He doesn't speak to us always the same, this, always the same way, but he can come many different ways. It can be from the subtle to the more direct, from the subtle aspect of just a sense of assurance. I get up from my prayer, I get up from my time, and I just feel different. I feel like something has changed. I don't see it yet. I don't understand it. I've been praying for God to deal with this, to lift this burden, and I don't see it yet, but I sense there's a change that's happening. God will speak in such a way that it just changes your spirit and your spiritual position in the situation. There can be a confirmation. A confirmation is when I pray for something and something happens that aligns with what I was thinking. I was thinking I should talk to this person and then the person calls you. This happened to me really just a couple of weeks ago because I was really praying and asking about whether I should intervene, intervene with a specific person. The person is not a member of the church. 
Um, but I, I knew this person and I was really praying whether I should intervene. I felt like they were in a place they needed to hear from somebody. And so I was praying about it for about two or three weeks. And then I found out this person had been trying to reach me. It's a confirmation because I was really hesitant in doing it for reasons I won't get into. I was really hesitant to stepping in the middle of this one. But then the person I heard the person was trying to reach me through a couple different channels. And when that happened, I said, okay, God, I hear you. It's a confirmation. I am going to reach out. And I pursued that person and made that connection. And that's in the works right now. So there's confirmation. There's an internal voice. An internal voice means I didn't actually hear an audible voice, but I heard something in my mind, spirit, I don't know how to describe it, that spoke to me. I've had this happen several times, not all the time. By the way, a lot of times we feel like, you know, we need to be hearing audible voices every day. People be talking about the Lord spoke to me every day. The Lord speaks in a lot of different ways, but you know, sometimes people are like, look, the Lord said this, and they repeat all these words that got, you know, it's possible. It's possible. But sometimes, yeah. When we look at the Bible, it gives us this impression that God spoke to the prophets like every day, every other hour, every minute. But we need to understand that what we're looking at is the written things that they experienced over years, oftentimes, 20, 30, 40 years, condensed into a book with a few chapters. It seems condensed wise, like God's speaking all the time, but it's really God speaking at critical times that they're sharing out and God speaking probably in a different way. And yes, they have interaction with God and God speaks to them, but in these particular times, there's a unique way because God speaks in many ways. And so I've experienced, I can certainly say of my own personal experience, I've had several experiences where I heard an internal voice. It wasn't a voice, it didn't have a pitch. It was more of a thought, if you will, but it was something that spoke to me and said words that turned my very thought and process and direction around. Oftentimes because what was heard was not what I would normally, it was not in the, in the, in the flow of what I was thinking or would normally think. And that's oftentimes when God speaks because he speaks to you when you're off direction. You're, you're misdirected and you need God's voice to put you in a right direction. And so you hear the voice of God speak. And so God spoke to me on several occasions. Certainly when I was in my callings, my callings to ministry, absolutely. There was a voice. I ignored the voice. I, I was subconsciously blocking out the voice until God dealt with me in such a way that it opened my mind to realize that I've been hearing this voice. And I was responding to the voice. You're going to be a minister. No, I'm not. In my mind, I'm responding to it, but I'm denying it at the same time to the point where subliminally I don't even hear it until God gets me to a point where he really gets my attention. I respond. And then I realize I've been hearing this voice. Like Samuel was hearing a voice and didn't understand it. God was speaking to me, and it's happened several times. You can hear an internal voice uh, as a way that God expresses himself to you. There can be external signs, things that on the outside, uh, the Bible talks about uh, times when they would make, oh, I can't remember the word all of a sudden. They would make, um, it would put something down as, as a test. And Lord, if such and such happens, Lord, let it rain. If it rains, we believe, whatever the case may be. And so there can be external signs that align with what God wants you to do. Um, there can be ultimately direct intervention where God can speak. God can show up. God can appear in a dream. God can appear in a vision. God can, I've had demons appear in visions. Certainly God can appear in, vision, in, in, in dreams. And certainly God can appear in a dream. Um, God can show up physically before you. There are many testimonies today, especially overseas, where they talk about seeing visions of either God or of Christ that comes to them and literally comes and sits and speaks with them or tells them something. Um, God can reveal himself any way he wants. He did in the Old Testament. He can do it now. And so God, what I say is, will speak to you in a way that, you need to hear him in order to know it's him. I believe that God can speak to you in such a way that you know this is God. And whatever that way is, whatever it is that's unique to that, whatever type of voice it is, whatever type of words he needs to use, whatever vocabulary, whatever language, God knows how to speak to you in a way that 
it will be no question in your mind. It's him. If you learn to listen, if you have two-way communication with him. Let's keep going. How do you know when you've heard from God? Number one, it aligns with the word of God. It'll align with the Bible. God's not going to tell you something that doesn't align with his word. Number two, um, it's a thought or a voice beyond yourself. That's what I was expressing earlier. When I've heard the voice of God, I've typically known it's God for, among other reasons, because of the fact that it is oftentimes not the way I would look at the situation. It's not necessarily the result I would want. It's not what I would want to do or think the way I'm thinking about the situation. I could be mad about something and God will speak something and it'll be bringing peace when I'm ready to fight. <laughs> right? I'm ready to go to the right and I'm determined looking at nothing but the right. I can't see anything but the right. And God will speak something that comes out of the left. Right? So oftentimes it's a thought or a voice and that it's clearly beyond yourself. I would not have said myself to do that. And, and by the way, it's not, it's something that aligns with God and God's word saying, so it's not like I heard something and said, yeah, let's go kill him. <laughs> right? Even though I, it's not like I'm saying, Lord, I want to sit here and God is saying to go do this and, and go this way and, 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 and you know, be, be, get mad and be vengeful. It's got to align with the word of God. And the third thing is there comes a time when you have to take a risk in what God is saying to you. You have to step out. Wow. Really? Yes. You have to have faith. When when God Moses heard the voice of God saying, you got to go back to Egypt, it was hard for him to comprehend. And ultimately, he had to take the risk of actually stepping out on that word. So faith plus trust equals risk. You're going to have to trust him enough to risk something. When Abraham heard from God, had nothing to do with his, his plans. God says, get up and leave all your land and go, and I'll do this and that and the other. Nothing to do, this is typical, typical God, nothing to do with what he was designed to do. Moses had no intention of going back to Egypt. But you hear the voice of God, and God affirms himself in you, but sooner or later you get to a point where you're just going to have to take that step. Because not, God's not going to do it for you. He's going to put you in a place where you hear him and you know it's him. And now you're going to have to take a step of faith on what he said, because what he told you is not something that you can do or control alone. That's how I know it's the voice of God. <laughs> it aligns with his will. It's confirmed in my spirit or through other things. And I know it's a right thing to do. And it makes me take a risk. Huh? God is not going to just pour out all the pieces and say, here you are. He's going to put you in a place that even if he shows you some of the pieces, he's not giving them all to you until you first take that first step. You have to take a step of faith on what God has said, or it will not come to pass. If you don't take that first step, you'll never see what is waiting for you. I'm going to keep going on this a few different ways because you got to get this. God will speak something to you and he says it's going to happen, but you won't see it unless you first take that step. There's a, there's an Indiana Jones movie. Now I know. Yeah. Right. But it's an Indian. It, it, when I saw it, it so showed me what faith was. It's a, it's a step where he's going and he's following this map to try and find this treasure. But there's a point where he gets to this cliff. He comes out of this cave and there's a just a drop. He's standing at, a, at an opening in the cliff, and there's nothing but a drop there. And he has to get to the other side, and it's probably, you know, 500 yards long. I mean, it's, it's well, 500 feet, half a football field or, or football field long. And there's nothing but air under him. And what the map has instructed him is, in essence, that you have to take a step of faith. And so he closes his eyes and he has his arms against the wall and he closes his eyes and he steps out onto the air and he lets go. And instead where he should have dropped hundreds of feet to, to the bottom of that, 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 that place, that, that valley, when he takes a step, there's something there that catches his foot. And when he steps out onto where he uh, where, where it looks like there's air from the angle he's now on he can see that it's an optical illusion 
and there's actually a bridge there that's camouflaged in the side of the wall ahead of him. You can't see it until you step out on it. And once you step out on it, then he could see there was actually a bridge there that was already prepared for him the way to get across. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about faith in God. You will not see it until you first take that first step. And this is where so many people lose it, which is why I'm taking the time to emphasize this to you today. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, and God is taking you on a journey, and you get to a crossroads, you get to a point where God is telling you to do something and you don't see how it's going to work. God tells you it's time to move, it's time to change, it's time to look for another job, it's time to give something, it's time to release something that he's already given you. Think about, uh, think about Abraham, who God had given him the son that he promised him, and now God is saying, give it back to me. And he has no understanding of what's happening, but he doesn't see the ram until what? He takes the step of getting ready to be obedient to God to take his son's life. You won't see the ram, you won't see the provision until you take the step. This is a principle of following God and trusting God and hearing the voice of God. I hope that helps somebody because that's not in the notes, but you needed to get that. Well, it's kind of here. Faith plus trust equals risk. You got to trust him enough to risk something, but now you understand what it means. You need to apply that into your life, your spiritual walk with God, because you are, if you're going to walk with God, I guarantee you, you're going to experience these times where God's going to tell you something that doesn't make sense to you, where you don't feel like you can do it, where you don't feel like it's possible of you, because now it's on you. Whatever he's telling you is on you, right? He'll do it. He'll say, this will be the outcome, but there's something you got to do, something you got to release, something you have to deal with, and you're going to have to be ready and willing to take that step. Lord, I place it in your hands. I give you back. Um, I give you back Isaac. Lord, I'll take the walk. I'll leave where I am and start going where I don't know where I'm going. Lord, I'll go back into that treacherous, treacherous city in Egypt where they were trying to kill me before, but because you told me I'm going to do it, you got to take the risk on what God says, and you will not see it until you first take the step. Somebody say, take the step. Type in there, take the step. Take the step. Somebody needed to hear that tonight. Let's finish this up. How to, be, how to better hear from God. Number one, be more familiar with his voice. What's the voice? Again, it's not necessarily an audible voice, but you have to be familiar with when God is telling you something. You have to be familiar when God is speaking to you. We talked about all voices of God, and I've shared in the church a couple of months ago in our Friday night prayer. I was hearing the voice of God as we were praying. I'm praying outwardly, but this voice and these thoughts and these words kept coming to me, and I know it's God. Why? Because I'm familiar with how God's voice speaks to me. I know it's God. Not usually God talking to me in the middle of me trying to pray to him, but God was speaking and making it clear. And I knew the voice of God. John 10, 27 says, my sheep recognize my voice. I know them. They follow me. You have to become familiar. And what does it mean? What does it take to become more familiar? Somebody tell me. It takes a relationship. The closer your relationship with God, the more familiar you become with him. The closer you, your relationship becomes with the person, the more familiar you are with that person. And so you have to become familiar if you want to recognize the voice of God in your life. Give him focus time. Learn how to listen. Don't be limited. Don't limit God in the way he chooses to speak to you. Because he may speak a different way to you through a different thing, through a different person, different situation than in the past. And God will, God sometimes will shift up. God, you always talk to me this way. I always know God's voice because he comes this way. Guess what? He shifts up on you and talks to you a different way. You don't, don't bottleneck what God wants to do. He may talk to you through a person. He may talk to you through a situation. You may look at somebody and something speaks to you, amen, about that, about that person, about the situation, about that person in the store, about that situation that's happened home. I was in a store the other day and, and, and somebody was, was, you know, um, was struggling to pay their bill. And, and it, it, something just immediately said, 
need to get, let me, let me do this. I can do this for that person, right? You need to understand when God is speaking to you about a person, a situation, a thing, whatever the case may be, you got to become familiar with it and be born, then become more responsive to it. Don't limit God. Be willing to hear and answer what you don't like, right? You may hear an answer. You don't like the answer, but you got to be willing to hear an answer you don't like. That's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> That's not what I wanted God to say. You can't just pray to God for what you want. You have to pray for him, we said at the beginning, for his will. So you got to be willing to hear an answer that you don't want to hear and you don't agree with. God, I want to get him. God says, nope, nope, I want you to love him. In fact, come take him, bring him in your home. What? Hey, hold up. God, I don't do that. I don't be bringing me. No, you have to be willing to hear the answer that you didn't want to hear. You got to be patient. You got to trust. God doesn't always speak when you want him to speak. Let me tell you this. There's something about becoming more mature in God. When you're a, a child, you need a lot more reassurance. When you are early in a relationship, there's need for a lot of time together for reassurance. When people get married, we tell them, don't take on a bunch of distractions. You get, need to get to know each other, spend time with each other. Your child, when they're young, they need a lot of encouragement. They come running back to you. They'll take two steps and come back to you. The older they get, the further and further away they get from you. In your relationship with God, you're like a child to God. And God will give you a lot of assurance, especially at the beginning. I remember some of the more miraculous things I saw was when I was first saved. I remember a friend of mine that got saved and in, in, in his begin, as soon as he got saved, he was testing God and God was doing some things, some miraculous things for him. I'm like, man, are you serious? Right? But as you get more mature, God will begin to pull back some of that. I'm talking in just a moment about miracles. Let's, let's see if we can get to that. Because we talk about miracles and divine interactions as a part of our relationship with God, our daily lives. Miracles do happen as part of your life, but God chooses how and when to intervene. It, it doesn't necessarily happen all the time. It happens all the time that he chooses how he's going to intervene, when he's going to intervene. And as you become more mature in God, he may actually pull back and be less frequent in terms of what and less obvious in terms of what he speaks and how he speaks and how he intervenes. And it doesn't mean he's forgotten about you or stopped loving you, but he's given you the opportunity to grow up and stand on your own faith. So the, the more established your relationship becomes with God, the more mature your ability to trust in him becomes, the less frequently he may directly engage. And so sometimes, the other thing, and I think somebody said this recently, uh, that I heard saying, you know, you have to understand that when you're uh, following God and you don't um, hear anything new from him, I think this was said on Sunday, actually, um, then you, what you need to do is you need to stand on the last thing God told you. Sometimes he's not telling you, and I've said this to people many times, sometimes he's not telling you anything else until you first do what he told you to do last time. Or it may be that what he's told you, that season is not over, so there's nothing new yet to tell you. So I want you to understand that the fact that you may be hearing from God in your mind less frequently or less directly, it doesn't necessarily mean that God has left you or doesn't care about you. It means that God has given you more opportunity to grow up and mature and to walk by faith and to live by faith versus needing that constant reassurance every minute that you needed as a child. The Bible says when I was a child, I, I spoke as a child, right? But and I spoke childish things. When I became older, I left childish things. And so as you mature, God brings you into a more mature aspect of relationship and you need to build your faith and trust in God. Part of the way he does that is by giving you opportunities for faith and trust which means you have to walk further without knowing where you're going or understanding than you did in the past. Hope you got that. God's impact on our choices and decisions, he's definitely concerned. We said this about before. 
He's helping us make godly choices. Is this the decision in line with God's word? Is this will this decision represent God's God appropriately? What would Jesus do? The bad word in this is submission. You've got to make godly choices. And so and make sure that the things that you're thinking, doing, align with God's will and word for your life. Has he declared something in terms of who you are? Do you know who you are? So be careful you don't operate out of character. If God tells you you're one thing, then don't act like something else. If he tells you you're a child, you're a priest, don't act like you're from the ghetto. Right? If he tells you that you are royalty, then don't act like somebody running down the street. <laughs> Behave and make decisions and respond in the character of what God has ordained for you as well. So I hope these things help you. Uh, I think we're just about done with this, this section. We already talked a little bit about this miracle section. And I want you to gather from this. Yeah, I think we're done. Yeah. So I want you to make sure that you maintain from this, um, this aspect that God is not just reluctant to do miracles in your life and doesn't want to. In fact, God is doing this, is what this is talking about. Miracles are happening around you all the time. You just don't always know it. God is working on your behalf all the time. You just don't know it. You don't know how many things he's kept you from. You don't know how many things he disallowed that the devil wanted to do to you. You don't understand how many times he measured and would not let it go beyond what you were able to actually handle. You don't understand how many times he's worked out something before you even get there. On this journey, you don't always see everything that God is doing, but God is working on your behalf because he cares about you, because he loves you. And oftentimes you really don't understand until you look back and you see where you came from. You see where you, what you've gone through. You understand where you are now versus where you were, but you really could not have charted a path to get there. These are many of the ways that you really realize that God is working on your behalf because God will do things and create things along the way that you could have never imagined. The Bible says beyond what you're able to imagine or think. And God will put you in places you never thought of, you never could imagine yourself being in, positions that you never thought you would be able to be or do. God will work it out for you. If you trust him, you walk with him, you stay in relationship with him. Is God part of your daily life? Absolutely, he is. Can you trust him to be that? Absolutely, you can. I just want to go through the questions that I had up earlier, and I think we've covered most of this, is what kind of daily interaction should we expect uh, with God. I think this is the most relevant of three we haven't talked about. How do we communicate with him? We've talked about that. What sort of impact does God have on a daily basis? We've talked about that a little. What kind of daily interaction should we expect from God? God is around. God is engaged and involved. Sometimes God reveals himself in more obvious ways than others. We think about when I almost had a car accident and all of a sudden uh, something happened and, and it stopped. And we think, okay, God is here. God has sent an angel. God is around you all the time. Many times the issue is we don't stop to pay attention to it. This is what prayer life is about. This is what having that sense of presence of God, that familiarity with God is all about. Because it puts us in a place to be sensitive to the fact that God is all around. A lot of times he does things, we just don't notice it. But when you're sensitive to God, you can say, oh, wow, look at how God made that work out. Look at how God provided that. It's that heart, that mindset of recognition and appreciation that makes us worshipers. And when you're a worshiper, it draws the presence of God even more. And the powerful thing about worship is you can worship anytime, any place and it can draw the presence of God into your life. That's how much he loves you. He will reaffirm himself. He will show up in your life. Our time is up. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I pray that you've received something from what we've shared with you tonight.